Hi everyone and welcome back to another lab session. In today's lab, we will walk you through how to configure and verify Cisco Discovery Protocol. We will discuss what is CDP and why do we need it and list all the advantages and disadvantages when using the CDP protocol. So CDP is a network protocol that is developed by Cisco Systems and it operates at the data link layer, which is layer two of the OSI model and is primarily used in Cisco devices such as routers and switches. So imagine you have a router and a switch in your network and you connect them with a network cable. Now think of CDP as a friendly neighborhood system that helps all the Cisco devices to get to know each other better. So when you enable CDP on both the router and the switch, it's like turning on a beacon that sends out hello messages every so often. Both the router and the switch start sending out these hello messages. They also listen for hello messages from other devices. And these messages contain important information about each device, like their names, IP addresses, and the ports that they are connected to. When the switch receives a hello message from the router, it learns about the router's presence. And similarly, the router receives a hello message from the switch and learns about the switch. So using these hello messages, the switch and the router can build a small map of the network. They know which devices are directly connected to them and gather some details about these devices. So some of the key characteristics of CDP is that it is a Cisco proprietary protocol so you can only find it on Cisco devices. CDP operates at layer two, as mentioned earlier, which means it doesn't require IP address to function, which allowing it to work in environments where network layer information is not available. And there are periodic advertisements where devices enabled with CDP periodically sends out advertisements to all directly connected devices. These advertisements include information such as device type, IP address, software version, capabilities, as well as hardware platform. So by gathering information from CDP, network engineers, you and I can map out the network topology. We also can identify device configuration and troubleshoot connectivity issues. So how does it work in general? So CDP enabled devices send out advertisements at regular intervals typically every 60 seconds. In terms of reception, the devices that listens for CDP advertisements from neighboring devices stores the information in a CDP table, which can be queried by the network engineer in order to gain insights into the network layout and device details. Okay, so what are the disadvantages of using CDP? So while CDP offers several advantages for network management, and troubleshooting, it also has some disadvantages and you should be aware of them. There is security risk by using CDP as it can potentially expose detailed information about network devices, such as IP address, software version, and device capabilities to unauthorized users if the network is compromised. This information could be exploited for targeted attacks. If CDP is enabled on interfaces where it is not needed, such as internet facing interfaces, it can unnecessarily expose network information or network details to external entities. Proper configuration and management are required to avoid such scenarios. Attackers, on the other hand, who gain access to a network segment can use CDP information to map out the network and identify critical devices, increasing the risk of targeted attacks. You also should know that CDP is a Cisco proprietary protocol, which means is not supported by non-Cisco devices. This obviously can be a limitation in multi-vendor environments. Although CDP packets are relatively small, they are sent periodically on all CDP-enabled interfaces in large networks with many devices, 
This can introduce additional traffic consuming bandwidth and processing resources. So what can you do to mitigate disadvantages? So in order for you to mitigate these disadvantages, you will need to disable CDP on interfaces where it is not needed, especially on external or untrusted interfaces. You can also implement network security best practices such as VLAN segmentation and access control lists or ACLs to limit access to CDP information and regularly monitor and audit the use of CDP in the network to ensure that CDP is configured appropriately and is not exposing sensitive information unnecessarily. Okay, so enough of that, and let's talk about the lab objective. The first objective is to learn how to configure and verify CDP protocol to view connected neighbor devices and the second objective is to provide connectivity across all department. We will explore what happens if we disable CDP on Cisco devices. Regarding the lab topology, we have two buildings. We have building one and building two, and each building consists of a small network. So building one has a couple of switches and a router that is connected to router 2, which is in building 2. And there are a couple of departments on each building. We can see that there is the IT department and the HR department that are part of building 1. And we can see that the sales department and the research department that are part of building 2. The links that are connected to the end hosts will be configured with the appropriate VLAN and access mode, whereas the link that interconnects the switches will be configured in trunk mode or static trunk mode. And that applies for building one and building two as well. And each interface from the switches to the routers will be part of a unique network. And the link between router one and router two will be a point-to-point -point link and we are planning to configure a static route to allow traffic from different departments across both buildings. Regarding the lab tables, the first table we are tackling is the router IPv4 address table. And as you can see on the screen, the table presents details regarding devices, interface configurations, and IPv4 address information. So we can see the device name column, which lists the name of the network device, the interface ID column, which displays the unique identifiers of the interfaces on the respective device. We can see the IP address column that shows what each interface will utilize in terms of IPv4 address. And finally, we can see the subnet mask column, which is the column that dictates how big is the network address. So for instance, the very first entry, which is router one gig ethernet 000, um, will have the IP address of 10.10.10.1 slash 30, which means we are only using two IPv4 addresses within that range. So regarding the switch VLAN table, the table present detail regarding devices, interface configuration, and associated VLANs. So again, the device name, similar to the previous table that we just discussed, and the interface ID is the same. However, the interface mode here, it indicates the operational mode for each interface and it specifies whether the interface is configured as access or trunk mode. Finally, we can see the VLANs column, which will dictate what is the VLAN ID that will be associated to a particular interface if it's in access mode. However, if it's in trunk mode, it will tell you the allowed VLANs for the interface in question. For example, gig ethernet one slash one slash three, we know that is going to operate in trunk mode and therefore it's going to um, allow VLAN 10 and 20. 
whereas the gig ethernet one slash one slash one that is going to operate in access mode and is going to only be part of VLAN 10. And that applies on the rest of the table. So regarding the SVI table, we can see the device name, the interface ID, the IPv4 address, and the subnet mask, which is basically we are creating an SVI interface on switch one, switch two, switch three, and switch four for management purposes. And each interface or each SVI interface will have the associated um, IPv4 address. So for example, switch one will have SVI 10, and that SVI 10 will have this IPv4 address, which is 192.168.10.11, and the subnet mask is going to be slash 24. And finally, we can see the host IPv4 address, and in there we have four PCs. Each PC is represents a whole department. So we know PC1 is part of the IT department and is going to have this IPv4 address, which is 192.168.10.100. Subnet mask is going to be slash 24, and we know that is part of VLAN 10. And the default gateway is going to be the router's interface IP address, which is 192.168.10.10. Okay, so the first task that we are going to tackle is the VLAN and SVI configuration. So on switch one and switch two, we are creating VLAN 10 and 20. We're gonna name each VLAN accordingly. On switch three and four, we're gonna do the same thing, but we are creating VLAN 30 and 40, and we are creating um, the name for each VLAN. We are also going to create the SVI as per the SVI table mentioned above. And that is gonna be applied across all switches. If we then move to the second task where we are going to do some trunk configuration and we are using the static method between the interconnected switches, so switch one and switch two. So on the interfaces that interconnects switch one and switch two, we are going to configure them with static trunk. And we're gonna do the same thing on switch three and four. We then gonna move to step number three, where we will do some access port configuration. So across all switches, we will configure gig ethernet one slash zero slash one um, with the appropriate VLAN access. And we are going to include the description as well. And we are going to force the mode to access mode. We will also verify and perform in-flight checks for each of the steps. Next, we will tackle router configuration. And on router one and router two, we will enable all interfaces that are connected to the LAN and WAN. So we have two interfaces that are connected back to switch one and two. I'm talking about from a router one perspective. And we are gonna enable these two interfaces. And we're gonna configure the IPv4 addresses for each interface as per our um, IPv4 address table. And we are going to do the same thing for the gig ethernet zero slash zero slash zero, which is connected back to router two. And we're gonna do the same thing on router two. And once we have done this, we will then perform some in-flight checks to make sure that all the ports have been enabled. And then we move to the next step where we will configure some static routes. So we will set a default route. So any traffic that is not part of the network, it will use the static route that will be populated within the routing table of each router. And this will be used to enable communication between building one and building two. We will verify that after we have configured both routers. We then move to step number five, where we will do some end host configuration. And just to let you know that all computers have been pre-configured with the appropriate IPv4 address, subnet mask, and the default gateway. And the main reason for this is to save time, nothing else, nothing more. 
we move to step number six, where we are going to view the CDP neighbors um, on switch one, switch two, and router one. We will then disable CDP globally on switch one and run re verify that by um, issuing the appropriate command to see what exactly we are seeing in terms of um, the number of neighbors, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we are going to initiate a ping from router one to switch one SVI interface and we will check if the ping is successful despite the fact that we have disabled CDP. And we will explain and discuss this further. And also we will tackle um, switch one. We will enable CDP globally once more. And then we move to step 11 where we disable CDP on each interface that is connected to an end host or it's down. And then we move to step 12 where we are going to disable CDP on interface gig ethernet 0 slash 0 slash 0 on router 1 and router 2. We will then go back to switch 1 and switch 2 to view the CDP neighbor details and observe the output. Uh, we will do that on switch 1 and switch 2 as well as router 1 and router 2. And then next, we will move to step number 15, where we are going to perform some connectivity tests. We will perform some pings from PC1 to PC2, PC1 to PC3, PC1 to PC4, and finally PC3 to PC2. And if the ping is successful, we can go ahead and save the configuration. Um, otherwise, we will need to perform some troubleshooting. And you can see that the troubleshooting steps have been highlighted here. So for instance, what we will need to do is we might need to check the VLAN configuration on each switch. We might need to verify that each port assignment is in the right VLAN. Um, and we need to ensure that the trunks are operating as expected and verify IPv4 address across the network, um, so on and so forth. Okay, this is the moment where I ask you to pause the video and give this a go yourself if you want to test your knowledge and skills. So in the video description, I included the lab document so that you can download it and practice at your own pace. And I also included a two packet tracer labs. The first one is the pre-configuration, which is for those who want the lab bridge to go through the lab challenges. And the other packet tracer file is the post configuration, which is for those who want to have the full solution uh, in order for them to be able to compare their solution with mine. Okay, so what I'm gonna do next, I'm gonna tackle the first task, which is uh, configuring VLAN as well as SVIs across all switches. So I'm gonna start with switch one. So I'm gonna click on the stencil and I'm gonna go to the CLI. And from here, I would go to global configuration mode and I would say VLAN 10. I'm going to name that VLAN with IT department. I'll do the same thing for VLAN 20. And I'm going to call it HR department. Next, I'm going to create the SVI interface for VLAN 10. So I'm going to say interface VLAN 10 and I will set the IPv4 address, which is 192.168.10.11/24, which is 255.255.255.0. And then I'm gonna hit the end command, and I'll I will do some in-flight checks. So I'll say show VLAN brief. And you can see that we have created these two VLANs. However, we haven't assigned any of the ports just yet. So let's move into switch two. And do the same thing. I'm going to start with VLAN 10. I'm going to name it with the IT department. Then I'll do the same thing for VLAN 20. Next, I will create the SVI for 20 or VLAN 20. Set the IPv4 address. I'm 
and then I'll do some in-flight checks VLAN brief and then you can see that I've created these two VLANs and then one other thing that I can do is show IP interface brief and I'm going to pipe include LAN and you can see that the SVI have been created successfully however the current state is the in the up down state and the reason why is up down is because we haven't assigned a VLAN to any of the interfaces yet. Let's just do the same thing on switch one because I don't think I have done that. So let me just do that quickly. So show IP interface brief, pipe include LAN. And you can see this is the SVI interface that we've created. Next, I'm going to move into switch three. I'm going to create VLAN 30 and I'm going to call it sales department. And then next I'm going to create VLAN 40 and I'm going to call it the research department. Next I'm going to create the VLAN 30 or um, SVI 30 with this IP address 192.168.30.11 slash 24, which is 255.255.255.0. We'll hit exit and then end. I'll just do in-flight checks. And you can see that I've created these two VLAN. Next, I'm gonna move into switch four. And then I'll perform in-flight checks. So I'm going to say show IP interface brief. You can see the interface I've created there. Next, I'll say show VLAN brief. And we have created these two VLANs. So the first task has been completed successfully. And then I'm going to move to the next task, which is creating and configuring the trunk uh, between switch two and switch one, as well as switch four and switch three. So I'm going to start with switch one, actually. So I'm going to go back to global config. And from here, I would say interface gig ethernet one slash one slash three. I'm going to set the description. Link to switch two. Switch port mode trunk. I'm going to do the same thing on switch two. I'll set the description first. And then what I'm going to do next, I'm going to do some in-flight checks. So I'm going to say show interface trunk. And here you can see that um, our current trunk or our COM port that supports trunking is gig ethernet one slash one slash three. And you can see that the current mode is on, which means it's been configured statically. The encapsulation is using dot one Q and the current status is trunking and the current native VLAN is one. In terms of the allowed VLANs, you can see that VLAN one all the way to 1005, all these VLANs have been or are allowed. However, the current VLANs that are active is one, 10 and 20. So let's do the same thing on switch one. So I'm going to end this and I'm going to say show interface status. 
can see that the current interface that is being configured is the gig ethernet one slash one slash three with the interface description and right now is connected and is operating in trunk. If I say show interface trunk, we get similar output to what we saw earlier on switch two. So let's do the same thing on switch three and switch four. So I'll go back to global config and I'll say interface gig ethernet one slash one slash three. Set the description. We're gonna say link to switch four and switch mode trunk. Let's jump into switch four. And then I'm going to go back to switch three and do some in-flight checks. So first of all, I'm going to say show interfaces um, trunk. And we get similar output to what we saw earlier on the switch one and switch two. Uh, let's do the same thing on switch four. And here we get also a similar output to what we saw on the switch three. Okay, so task two is completed successfully. Let's move into task three, where we're gonna go and do some access port configuration across all the all the switches. Um, so these access ports are the ports that are connected to the end hosts. So I'm gonna go back to global config and I'm gonna set the interface gig ethernet one slash zero slash one. I will set the description first and I would say link to end host I will uh, set the switch port mode to access switch port access VLAN 10 I'll do the same thing to the interface that is connected back to router 1 so I'll say 1 slash 1 slash 1 let's do the set the description first and then issue the same commands as what we've issued for the end host. Now that we have done this configuration on switch one, we can do some in-flight checks. So I'm gonna say show interfaces status. And you can see that we have configured three interfaces. These are the gig ethernet one slash zero slash one, which is connected back to the end host and the current status is connected and is part of VLAN 10. The gig ethernet one slash one slash one, which is connected to router one is also, it says not connected at the moment. And the reason being is because the interface on router one by default is admin down. So we would need to, to log into router one and enable these interfaces. And then that will, the status of this interface will change from not connected to connected. And you can see that this part of also VLAN 10. And then finally, the gig ethernet one slash one slash three, which is the link that is connected to switch two is connected and is operating in trunk mode. If you want to reveal the configuration, you can say show run pipe section and then include the interface ID, for, for instance, like one slash zero slash one. And then you can just add the dollar sign so that it doesn't it stops at this point if you hit enter you can get the exact configuration output from the running config as you can see on the screen and you can repeat the same thing for interfaces one slash one slash one and then finally one slash one slash three okay let's do the same thing quickly on switch two so i'm gonna say show interfaces status and here we haven't configured any of that. So I'm actually going to tackle switch two. So I'm going to go back to configure terminal and I will say interface gig ethernet one slash zero slash one. And then I will 
set the description. We're going to say link to end host. And we're going to set the switchboard mode to access. And we're going to set the VLAN to 20. And then next, we're going to tackle the interface that is connected back to router 1, which is going to be interface gig ethernet 1 slash 1 slash 2. Let's set the description link to router 1. And then let's set the access mode and the VLAN as well. Let's perform some in-flight checks. So I'm going to say show interfaces status. And you can see that the only interface that is not connected is the interface that's connected back to the router. This interface is connected and is operating trunk. And that interface is also good to go. It's connected to the end host and is connected right now and is part of VLAN 20. Let's jump into switch 3 and switch 4 and perform the same configuration. Let's perform some in-flight checks. So show IP interface brief. You can see this interface is up. Actually, let's use the show interface status. That would be easier since we have configured the interface description. So this link is good to go. It's part of VLAN 30 and is connected to the end host. We have the gig ethernet one slash one slash one link to router two. We know it's not connected at the moment. And, and the reason being is because the other side on router two, the interface is admin down, but still the interface is part of the VLAN 30. We also can see that gig ethernet one slash one slash three is also connected. And that is the link that is connected back to switch four and is operating in trunk mode. Let's jump into switch four and do the same thing. Now that we have configured both interfaces on switch four, let's do some in-flight checks. So I'm going to say show interfaces status. And again, we get similar output to what we saw earlier with regards to um, switch three. And let's add one more command, which is the show VLAN brief. And you can see that these two interfaces are part of the research department. That interface is connected back to the end host and that interface is connected to back to the router. And both interfaces are part of the VLAN 40, as you can see on the screen. Similarly with switch three, if we say show VLAN brief, we get the same thing. However, these two interfaces are part of the sales department, which is in VLAN 30. If I do the same thing on switch one, again, these two interfaces are part of the VLAN uh, 10, which is in the IT department. And finally, if I do that on switch two, you can see that these two interfaces are part of the HR department or VLAN 20. So next, we're going to tackle step number four, um, which is the router configuration. 
And here we are going to configure all three interfaces. Um, so two interfaces that are connected back to the LAN, and then one interface that is connected to router two. And we're going to configure all of these three interfaces. And then we're also going to configure a static route. So let's start with router one. So I'm going to tackle the interface gig ethernet 000, which is connected back to router two. So I'll say interface gig ethernet zero slash zero slash zero. I'm going to set the description first. I'm going to say link to router two. I will set the IPv4 address, which is going to be 10.10.10.1 slash 30, which is 255.255.255.252. And I will enable the interface. So I'm going to say no shot. Let's do the same thing for interface 0 slash 0 slash 1, which is connected back to switch 1. So I'm going to set the description. And I'll say link to switch 1. And let's just configure the IPv4 address, which is 192.168.10.10 slash 24. And let's enable the interface. Next, let's do the second interface, which is connected back to switch 2. And that interface ID is gig ethernet 0 slash 0 slash 2. Let's set the description first. I'm going to say link to switch 2. And then we're going to set the IPv4 address, which is 192.168.20.10. And the subnet mask is slash 24, which is 255.255.255.0. Let's enable the interface. And now let's just perform some in-flight checks. You can see that we have three interfaces that have been configured with the appropriate IPv4 address. However, you can see that Gig Ethernet 000 is in the up down state, and the reason being is because the other side hasn't been enabled yet. So, before we jump into router 2, let's configure the static route as per requirements. So, I'm going to go back to the global config, and from here, I'm going to say show, sorry, I'm going to say IP route, and I'm going to hit the question mark to reveal the content sensitive help. And here we can say that the destination prefix is going to be 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0, which means any destination. If the router one is not aware of the network address, then I need you to take this traffic and forward it to the next hop. And then if we also issue the question mark after this, we will get the prefix mask and the prefix mask also is going to be anything. So I'm going to set, set it to all zeros. And then next, if I hit the question mark again, you can see the content sensitive help there. And I'm going to actually set the forwarding router's address, which is going to be 10.10.10.2, which is the IPv4 address on routers to gig ethernet 000. I will hit enter. And then I will hit end. And then at this point, let's log into router two and try to do the configuration on the other side as well. So let's do that. Go back to router two, go to the CLI. And from there, let's do the configuration. So I'm going to start with zero slash zero slash zero. I'm going to hit the, I'm going to set the description first. And then let's set the IPv4 address, which is 10.10.10.2 slash 30, 255.255.255.252. And let's enable that interface as well. Next, let's do the same thing for gig ethernet 001, which is connected back to switch three. Let's set the description. Let's set the IPv4 address, 
which is uh, 192.168.30.10/24, and let's enable the interface as well. Next, let's configure the interface that's connected to switch four. Let's set the description first, and then set the IPv4 address, which is 192.168.40.10/24. Now let's enable the interface. Gonna hit end, and let's do some in-flight checks. You can see that all three interfaces are in the up up state, and each interface has been configured according to the IPv4 address table. Next, we would need to configure the static route. So I'm going to go back to global config, and from here, I'm going to say IP route 0 .0 0.0.0.0 .0 with the subnet mark 0, .0, 0.0.0. And then the, the next hop address is going to be 10.10.10.1. .10 .10 and I'm going to hit end. And now let's do some in-flight checks. So I will say show IP route, for instance. And I'm going to include 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0. And here you can see that we have implemented or installed a static route in the routing table. So if I reveal the full table, so if I say show IP route, you can see this is the full table that we have at the moment. I'm not going to explain the code and all the details in the in the output because that's going to be part of another session. But right now, what I want to draw your attention to is this statement over there or this entry. You can see that the static route has been implemented in this routing table, and which means if there is any traffic or any, if I'm trying to reach a network that that is not being installed in the routing table, then I'm going to use this static route, which is the default gateway. With that being said, let's check the routing table on router one. So I'm going to go back to router one. And here, I will actually first, sorry, I will check the interface status first. You can see previously it was in the up down state and now is in the up up state, which is good. Now let's issue the show IP route. And you can see we have also installed a static route in the routing table. So the next step is to configure the end host. Just to let you know that this already this step has already been done, so I don't need to do it, but I would just walk you through a couple of pieces where you can see that the current config or the current um, IPv4 um, address information has already been set up. So you can see this is PC1 with this IPv4 address, this subnet mask, and this is the default gateway. If I do the same thing on PC4, go to desktop and then IP config, you can see this is the IPv4 address, the subnet mask, and the default gateway. So next, let's move into step number six, where we are going to reveal the CDP information across switch one, switch two, and router one. So let's start with switch one. So you can issue this command, show CDP neighbors. And here, based on the output, what you see on the screen is we can see a section called the capability codes. So R stands for router. T stands for Transbridge, B stands for Source Root Bridge, S stands for Switch, H stands for Host, I stands for IGMP, and so on and so forth. Right now, we can see these are the columns of all the headers of the table. So we have the device ID. This is pretty much is the name of the neighboring device. So we have Switch 2 and Router 1. We can see the local interface, which is the local interface from switch one's perspective. So switch one, we can see that switch one is connected to switch two from one 
1.1.3 or gig ethernet 1 slash 1 slash 3 is also connected to router 1 from gig ethernet 1 slash 1 slash 1. The hold time is the time in seconds that the CDP information for this neighbor will be retained. We can see the capability and the capability is the field that shows the capabilities of the neighboring device using the codes listed above. So it does say here R, which means is a router. And for some reason, Packet Tracer is not defying or is not being able to find the capabilities of Switch 2. I assume this is a bug, um, but it should either show you it's a switch, with this, which means it's an S, um, or it's uh, an R because it's a switch that is operating a layer 3. Um, but for some reason, is not showing you here what is the capability for Switch 2. You can see on the platform is giving you the model of the hardware. So switch two is 3650, whereas router one is using ISR 4300. Then we can find the port ID. And under the port ID, it means that this is the ID that our neighboring device is connected to us from this interface. So this is the interface from switch two perspective that is connected to switch one. Similarly with router one, so router one interface is gig ethernet 001. Let's do the same thing on switch two. We get similar output. You can see that we are neighboring with switch one as well as router one. You can see the local interface that we are connected to switch one. We connected to switch one via gig ethernet one slash one slash three. Similarly with router one, we connected to router one from gig ethernet one slash one slash two. And the remote end interface is gig ethernet zero slash zero slash two from router one perspective and gig ethernet one slash one slash three from switch one perspective. The whole time again, we explain the whole time and the capabilities as well as the platform and everything is the same pretty much. Let's then do the same thing on router one. And router one, we can see that we have actually three devices. So we can see switch one. We can also see switch two and we can see router two. We know that router two is connected via local interface, gig ethernet zero slash zero slash zero. We also know that the remote interface is gig ethernet zero slash zero slash zero. We know that the router's two capabilities is R, which is router, and the current platform is ISR 4300. Next, let's move into step seven, where we're gonna disable CDP globally on switch one. So I'm gonna go back to switch one. So I'm gonna go back to global config, and from here, I would say no CDP run. And now let's verify that this actually has been taken effect. So I'm going to say show CDP neighbor, and you can see that CDP is not enabled. And then if I go to switch to, if I up arrow, you can see that we are still seeing switch one. However, we have to wait for the hold timer to run out. And this is when the entry will be removed from the CDP table. So you can see that the timer is going down and is not being updated. So you need to wait until the network is converged and, and then you will be able to see that switch one entry no longer exists.
Okay, so as you can see, the entry for switch one has been removed and you can see that we've got only one neighboring device, which is the router one device. So let's initiate a ping from router one to switch one SVI interface. So I'm gonna go back to router one and we're gonna say ping 192.168.10.10 or actually dot 11. And you can see that we have successful ping and the first packet or the first ICMP echo message is dropped because of uh, ARP. So if I repeat this again, we should be able to get 100% success. So that means the ping is successful and disabling CDP only stops the device from sending and receiving CDP packets, which are used for discovering and sharing information about directly connected Cisco devices and it does not affect the device's IP-based communication capabilities. So let's go back to switch one and enable CDP globally. So I'll go back to global config. And from here, I'm gonna say CDP run, and I'm gonna end this. And let's issue the show CDP command. And here you would get like global information about CDP protocol. So for instance, we can see that sending CDP packets every 60 seconds, these are the default parameters and the hold time value is 180 seconds and also is using CDP version two advertisement is being enabled. Let's move to step number 11, where we are going to disable CDP on each interface that is either connected to the end hosts or is down. So I'm gonna go to global config and then from here I would say interface range gig ethernet one slash zero slash one. I'm gonna include the dash, um, which means or implies I wanna So basically, this means that I want to configure multiple interfaces simultaneously. And we are starting from gig ethernet one slash zero slash one. And we are going all the way to 24 or slash 24. I'm going to add comma to add another interface, which is gig ethernet one slash one slash two. And finally, gig ethernet one slash one slash four. And here we're gonna say no CDP enable. I'm gonna hit end and I'm gonna save the config. Let's do the same thing on switch two. And then I'm gonna include one slash one slash two and gig ethernet one slash one slash four and here i'm gonna say no cdp enable gonna hit end and i'm gonna save let's jump into switch three and then go to global config and from here we're gonna say show Sorry, we're going to say interface range gig ethernet one slash zero slash one all the way to 24. We also going to include gig ethernet one slash one slash two and gig ethernet one slash one slash four. We're going to say no CDP enable. Let's jump into switch four. And here we're going to say no CDP enable. So let's perform some in-flight checks. I'm going to go back to switch one. 
And from here, I'm going to say show run. And I'm going to hit enter. And you can see these interfaces are not being used. So they either down or not being used, or they are facing the end hosts. And you can see the command here being implemented or configured. So no CDP enable. And the only interfaces that right now that CDP is enabled is on gig ethernet one slash one slash one and gig ethernet one slash one slash three. So next, let's move into step 12, um, where we're going to disable the CDP protocol on interface gig ethernet 000 on both routers, router one and router two. So let's go back to router one. Gonna go back to global config. And from here, I would say interface gig ethernet zero slash zero slash zero. And here I would say no CDP enable. I will hit end and I'll do the same thing on router two. Okay, so at this point, let's go to step 13, where we're going to reveal the CDP neighbor on switch one and switch two. So I'm going to go back to switch one, and I'm going to say show CDP neighbor. And you can see that we still see router one and switch two. Next, let's move into step 14, where we're going to reveal the CDP information on router one. So I'm going to go back to router one and I'm going to do this. So on the switch two, we have noticed that the we have configured the wrong interface with regards to disabling CDP. So this interface is the interface that is connected back to router one. So I would need to rectify this. So I'm gonna go back to global config and I'm gonna say interface gig ethernet one slash one slash two, and I'm gonna say CDP enable. I'm gonna hit end and I'm gonna save this. And then if I go back to router one and issue the show CDP neighbors, you can see that right now we can see switch one. You can see right now that we have switch one and switch two and router two is no longer exist. So router two has been uh, removed from the CDP table. So if I go to router two and do the same thing, so if I say show CDP neighbor, you can see that I can only see switch three and switch four. And that covers step number 14. Okay, so one of the commands that I would like to share with you as well is the show CDP neighbor details. So I'm going to say show CDP neighbor and then include the word detail at the end of the command. And if I scroll a little bit up here, you would get more granular information about your neighbor. So for instance, we start with the device ID, which we know is switch three. And if there is a management IP address has been configured, it will list it here. So you can see that their management IP address is 192.168.30.11. It does tell you the current platform is using Cisco 3650 and the capabilities, as I said, or as I mentioned earlier, is null, is set to null, and that's due to a bug in a packet tracer. And it tells you the interface that is connected to via gig ethernet 001. And the outgoing port from the switch three perspective is gig ethernet one slash one slash one. 
It also gives you information about the software version. So it tells you that this is Catalyst Layer 3 switch with the current software version 16.3.2. And also it tells you the iOS type, which is iOS XE software. And in some instances, you will be able to read the current iOS image as well. So that is pretty much it for the show CDP neighbors detail command. So next, let's move into task 15, where we're going to do some connectivity tests. So I'm going to go back to PC1. I will click on PC1 and I'm going to go to the command prompt. And from here, I'm going to say ping 192.168 dot let's say 20 dot 100 so you can see that the ping is successful so we are able to reach the hr department and let's try to reach to the sales department and we have connectivity if i repeat the test again you can see that is 100% success. Let's do the same thing for the research department. And here we also have full connectivity. Just let me repeat the test again. And it is 100% success. So now that we have successful connectivity between all departments, we can go ahead and save our configurations across all our devices. So that's it folks for this video. If you found this video helpful, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss our future tutorials and tech insights. If you have any questions, comments, feel free to drop a comment below. I read all your comments and I'm here to assist you. Remember, consistency and hands-on practice are key to success. Stay curious, stay inspired, and until next time, peace.